response. Yes, we're recording this morning. So proceedings, right? Uh, so in the chat box, if you go to the chat box, I have posted a link in the chat box. So go to the chat box, click on that link, and we will activate the poll. And I will see your responses to the poll that I have posted. So again, go to your chat box, click on that link that I've posted, and then you proceed to answer. And you will see real time your, um, your responses in terms of how the summary of your responses, okay? So I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to log on, click on that link and post a response. You just have to type in your name and um, what does it mean to you in a few words, maybe two or three words. Doesn't have to be a whole long sentence. It could be two words, three words, one word, whatever. What does it mean to you? When you hear the term exchange rate, what does that mean to you? Again, I'm waiting. Okay, I see currency. Okay, so we're seeing, okay, currency seems to be the predominant word in the cloud. Value, measurement. Okay, foreign, local, relation to one. Okay, so I'm seeing currency seems to be the predominant uh, currency value. Okay. So that's why we have three responses. Let's get a couple, couple more. Let's get at least one more. Let me encourage one more, one more, at least one more. We have three responses so far. So let's get a couple more. All right, very good, very good. Looking good, looking good. Right. All right, so you see, if you look at, when you look at your screen now, I'm sharing my screen. So you look at your screen and the largest word is currency um, and then followed by value. Uh, then we have countries and then we have exchanged and so on. So we see that you have a pretty good idea. Yes, we're talking about currency and the currency value. Um, so thank you for your responses there. And I will stop sharing this particular screen. We have a few more, more of those polls. And if we have more people that are joining us, good morning. I see Samara just joined us. Good morning, Samara. I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday morning. We'll be having fun here. Um, and as I said, you can either, if you have a question as you go, as we go along, you can post a question in your chat or you can raise your hand and ask the question when and by activating your mic. Um, I would ask that if you are not speaking, then keep your mics on mute. If you want to share your, uh, your camera, your video, feel free to do so. Uh, I will be sharing mine. So, um, of course, you can see who I am. Again, Samara, my name is Darren Conrad, and I will be facilitating this discussion this morning. So I'm going to share with you the uh, screen that we'll be uh, working with today. Again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, great. So today we'll be talking about exchange rate. And I, I, I kind of phrase it as an exchange rate discussion because I ho I'm hoping to be able to hear your perspectives on it. How does it affect you and so on? So we're talking about the exchange rate and I kind of framed it in, in three fundamental questions because if we ta start talking about the exchange rate, that's about maybe about six, six to nine hours of, of, a, of lecture in mind because we can go on and on, ad infinitum about that. But we kind of ask three fundamental questions. Why is the exchange rate so important? That's the first question we'll try to address. And moving into that, when we go through some basic definitions, is currency devaluation overrated? Um, I know you would have heard a lot of discussion in the media. You may have had your own discussions with your, with your peers. Um, 
you may have had discussions with other people about the valuation and what that what the implications are and then we have to, to wrap that up we'll talk about what else can be done in Trinidad and Tobago so I'm hoping that you'll be able to stay for thing because the entire session because it's, it's enlightening um it won't go for the full three hours but you know we we, we I targeted this to be in the vicinity of of two two and a half hours now when you come to the University of the West Indies your classes generally are two hour lectures and one hour tutorial so you meet Three, time, three hours for the week, right? Um, hopefully some undergrad students from the university will join us. By the way, can I just find out how many of you all are from, and which school you're from? You can type in the chat or you can activate your mic. Which school are you from? Let's start with uh, Makala. Johansi, Queens Royal College, okay. So we have Queens Royal College. Bishop Anstey High School, okay. Naprima Girls High School, okay. Southeast Port of Spain, okay. Bishop Anstey. Um, so, uh, Makala, is that the one in uh, Trinity? That Bishop's in Trinity? Or is the same one in Port of Spain? Port of Spain, okay. Carpichima East Secondary. Okay, so we have a, a nice representation here. So hopefully some other, I hopefully you can WhatsApp some of your friends and tell them join because the discussion is going to be a lively one. Well, I think so. All right, so let me just advance this here. So in, in terms of the, the format, we have the introduction, some definitions, uh, exchange rates, we'll talk general exchange rates, we'll talk about what that implications are. Then we'll talk about exchange rate regime evolution it, with regards to Trinidad because our exchange rate um, regime has evolved over time to where it is now, um, which needs a further evolution. We'll talk about appreciation versus depreciation, devaluation, devaluation effects, what are the implications if we do devalue the currency. Um, I'll share a little bit with you uh, about a paper that I wrote that speaks to how and when should the currency be devalued and when it is devalued scientifically i've calculated exactly how much it should be so that's going to be very interesting and of course we'll talk about some ongoing macroeconomic concerns which has implications for the currency value and we have alternatives to devaluation which we can also do and we'll see what what needs to be in place before devaluation takes place you can't just devalue just like that right there are certain conditions that must be present um i, I always say that you know, when you listen to the to the to the news and the meteorologist says they are the perfect conditions for a storm or the perfect conditions for a hurricane. Well, they are perfect conditions that are needed for <laughs> devaluation to be successful, right? And it can be very successful. And then, of course, I'll wrap up with some remarks. Of course, if you have questions as we go along, um, feel free to ask the questions, post the questions in the chat, or alternatively, raise your hand, and I will be able to uh see you there right um let me just get back here all right so you can raise your hand and i have all my screens up to be able to see when you raise your hand and how we will proceed from there so why the fuss about exchange rate why all the fuss about exchange rate no it, it's a critical value of course you said it's a currency value is the price we attach to everything that we, we do um and you see, it, it affects our cross-border uh, economic transactions. So it affects our terms of trade and our trade balances. So whether we run a deficit or, or we run a surplus, that's how powerful it is. And, and boy, oh boy, I'll show you how long we've been running a deficit in Trinidad in, not now in our terms of trade. So it tells us something is definitely wrong. Um, uh, uh, a competitive exchange rate is critical for economic growth. Now, these are studies that were done, right? And economic growth is what everyone strives to achieve. So without the economic growth, we can't enjoy certain luxuries, right? We enjoy quite a bit of luxuries here in Trinidad, we have to admit. Um, and of course, the exchange rate is the most important price. As you rightly said, it determines the, the terms of trade as well as relative prices of every good that we purchase. Now you tell me the implications. Now our exchange rate determines exactly what we can consume, what we see on the shelf or not. And 
when we get to the discussion of devaluation or appreciation and that kind of thing, we'll see, well, okay, certain things might disappear because it will become more expensive. So, and we see it already, right? We keep hearing about, you know, the, the, what is going on in the Ukraine that's affecting the price of oil and the price of oil is affecting everything else. And of course, it puts pressure on currency as well because it also affects demand and supply is compromised. So we'll see how that pans out in the system. Um, so, so let's set the stage. We have to make some assumptions and set the stage in terms of our discussion. We can't just talk about exchange rate without saying certain things. So we're talking about within the context of an open economy. Yes, we are a small island state. We are a SID. SIBS is what we call small island developing states. So, but that, but we're still open. We're an open economy. We have trade. We trade with part. We have trade in partners. We trade with countries globally. We trade with countries regionally. So we have inter-regional trade. We have extra-regional trade. So of course we are an open economy. So we have you know so the two main features of an open economy. There's international trade in goods and services, which of course is present here, and then there's worldwide integration of financial services. And of course we have a very robust financial um, sector. Um, as a matter of fact, our financial sector in Trinidad, um, the assets of the financial sector in Trinidad is the equivalent of the country's GDP, which is 20 billion US. So imagine how robust the financial sector that is. Imagine that 20 billion US in assets in the four major players, banks in Trinidad, just the banks. We didn't reach to the credit unions. We didn't reach to all the other financial institutions around, but the four major banks um, have assets to the tune of 20 billion US, which is Trinidad and Tobago's uh, GDP, right? So we see we have that, that, that there's worldwide financial integration here and the implications for that. So there are a few things. We have different terms that we use when we're talking about exchange rates. Just like we talk about prices, we have the nominal price, we have the, the real price, but it's all about the adjustments that we make. So the nominal exchange rate, what's that? Well, it, it, it really is... If someone in a country wants to buy a good from, from, from someone in another country, so we want to buy a good from the US, we have to hear the exchange rate first. So you'll have to exchange your currency for that of her trading partner currency, right? I should be gender neutral here, I should say there, right? But um, so we have to determine now our exchange rate doesn't really fluctuate and we'll get to why. So for example, um, let, let me see, uh, today, uh, we have exchange, our uh, exchange rates are published daily and uh, we have our exchange rates for today and I'll share that screen now with you. So we'll be doing quite a bit of that. So we have our exchange rates for today and the central bank publishes this daily, right? So we have the Japanese yen, the US dollar, we have the, both the buying rate and the selling rate. Of course, the buying rate is the rate at which they purchase the currency from a customer over the counter. And the selling rate is the rate at which they sell you the currency. And the selling rate is always a little bit higher than the, the buying rate. Um, so that's why a lot of people tend to, when they have to sell their currency, when they come to Trinidad, they would sell it on the black market because somebody might be willing to pay $10 for, for one US dollar based on how critical the need is for them. Um, and the selling rate is, is, is 679 for today. And that has been like that for a while, right? And we understand why, even though we have, we say we have a floating exchange rate regime. Um, so we have all the different currencies. Uh, we have the US dollar, we have the Japanese yen, we have the Jamaican dollar. Jamaican dollar, well, we could go Jamaica and have a good time because we can uh, buy the Jamaican dollar for a few cents. Um, Guyanese dollar, well, we could go Guyana and have a good time, right? Not such a good time in the US. Um, and, and in the UK, and of course, with the British pound, the euro, well, we're in trouble with pound and the euro. So we, we, we kind of kind of look at to see, well, where can we have a good time? Because, you know, you need to know where the exchange rate is, is, is working in your favor. So that is published daily. So we, we and, and of course, it's published daily by virtue of it being a floating currency, a floating currency. So it varies, it, it should vary from the today, right? So we're back here. So that's for the nominal exchange rate. Then we have, as I said, if you have questions, post it in the chat. Let me see who, if anyone else joined us since then. 
yes we have more people joining us surely welcome those of you who just joined us um thank you for joining us and um we're talking about exchange rates we're now talking about the nominal ex the, the we talked about the, the nominal ex we're talking about the nominal exchange rate right so it's, it's really how we trade right is the number of units of a foreign currency that can be purchased with the units of a domestic currency and that that is what the nominal exchange rate is and then we have the, the exchange rate systems so we have the flexible exchange rate the flexible exchange rate system which is really a floating currency so you're not pegged to a foreign currency but the value of your currency on a daily basis is based on the demand in the foreign exchange market so we have countries that have their currency freely floating and it actually varies from day to day ours is a floating currency and we'll see it's a managed float It's a float but a managed float um and so under the flexible exchange rate or the floating exchange rate which is generally known as your currency rate moves continuously so you know you sort of want to see where the currency is going before especially for for merchants who are importing goods you know you want to see where the currency is moving if the currency is high today you may hold off on any foreign purchases um you wait and see if it will be low tomorrow and it's all based on the the, the demand in the foreign exchange market if the demand is high of course the value of the currency it will kind of the, the the value will kind of peak um if it's low then it, it kind of come down so you know you'll kind of hedge to see well when am i going to purchase goods uh as based on where, where the currency is and of course we have the fixed exchange rate which is what is set at, the, at a predetermined level not just a determined level but a predetermined level and it's maintained by the commitment of the central bank to buy and sell their own currency. So the central bank is key in the process of the exchange rate in terms of the fixed exchange rate. So to maintain that exchange rate, the central bank will buy and sell its own currency, the own, our own currency to keep it steady. Now, I'm not sure if you can recall, but there was a time when our exchange rate was fixed and one US dollar was $2.75 TT. So I'm not sure if you would have heard anybody talk about that. I know you wouldn't know that price of, 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 of a US dollar, but it was uh, $2.75. Of course, you, you couldn't just go and buy foreign currency in, in the banks, right? It was, it was um, limited in terms of how much you could get. It was a restriction, but it was $2.75, right? Um, but now it's no longer $2.75, as you well know. I'm sure you're familiar with the value of the currency. We just saw it $6.79 um, selling um <clears throat> now the difference now so we have the nominal value and when we have the real value now the nominal value is not what we use to compare from one year to the other or from one country to the next we use the real value just like when we're comparing prices from price increases from one year to the next we use the real price uh not the nominal price the nominal price of a good is the price that we pay today in dollars uh the real price is is adjusted uh for with inflation right so that we get the actual value so the real value of the dollar the real price is always lower than the nominal price so when you're comparing the price of a good last year to this to this year you don't compare the nominal price that tells you nothing that's comparing our apple storage so you compare the real price which is adjusted for inflation right so the real exchange rate is based on a price index of a basket of goods and that sounds familiar to you, right? Something like a consumer price index where we adjust the price for inflation. Um, so that's the same concept here in that we have a nominal exchange rate and then we have the real exchange rate, which tells us a lot more. So we have the nominal, we also have the nominal effective exchange rate and the real, uh, if real effective exchange rate. Um, the nominal effective exchange rate tells us one thing, but the real effective exchange rate tells us something completely different, which is more insightful. It gives us a look at not just the, let's use that cliche, not just the forest, but what is all going on on the ground, the, the, the actual plants on the ground uh, uh, under the, the, the canopy of the trees. So again, tells us two different things. So we always tend to, in economics, we use the real instead of the nominal. Uh, so here we have the, the formula for the real exchange rate. And of course, it is the nominal exchange rate. And then we have the, the, by the price multiplied by the price of the domestic good 
divided by the price of the foreign good. So we make an adjustment in the nominal exchange rate by using price. So we're creating an index, right? So that gives us a more real picture of what goes on when we're comparing the currency value um, from country to country or from year to year. So then we have appreciation. We have nominal depreciation and nominal appreciation. So of course in economics, we, you know that you, you covered that already. What is versus nominal and what is real? Nominal is what should be and real is what is. Is it so? Yeah. No. Is it the other way around? Help me out here. What is nominal? Nominal is one is what should be and the other one is what is. Yeah. Something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Go Google it and tell me. Um, but don't leave the, the session. Under the nominal depreciation, um, a dollar buys less units of a foreign currency. It becomes weaker. Right? And under the nominal appreciation, the, 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 the dollar buys more. So it becomes stronger. So you're saying the currency is strong. You hear people say the currency is strong today or is weak today. They're talking about how many units a dollar buys in, in terms of foreign currency, right? So it's either strong or it's either weak. So we have depreciation if it's weak, it's, it's weaker. And for the appreciation, it becomes stronger. Now, appreciation and depreciation are associated with exchange, flexible exchange rates because with a fixed exchange rate, you don't have appreciation and depreciation. And you'll see what is going to emerge now, right? So we are supposed to be talking about our exchange rate as a flexible exchange rate. Our exchange rate is a floating currency. It's flexible, flexible or floating, used interchangeably. So when you talk about <clears throat> flexible exchange rate, that is supposed to be, when you're talking about the, the uh, you're talking about that currency change in value, you're talking to, you're supposed to be talking about appreciation or depreciation. Because remember we said with a flexible exchange rate, the price of the currency continuously changes. So we're supposed to be using the terms appreciation and depreciation. <laughs> so today I can buy more of a foreign good. It means the currency is stronger. Tomorrow I can buy less of, that means it has appreciated. And tomorrow the value is lower. Sorry, I can buy less units of a foreign good or a foreign currency. It means that the, the currency has, um, depreciated, right? So if I can buy more of the foreign currency with my, my currency, it means it's strong. If I can buy less of the foreign currency with my foreign currency, with above a foreign currency with my currency, it means it's weak. So we have appreciation and depreciation. Now here's what. When we talk about our currency, we always talk about devaluation. But devaluation is coming in the context or spoken of in the context of a fixed exchange rate. Look at point two. The fixed exchange rate equivalence of appreciation and depreciation is devaluation and revaluation. But we always talking about devaluation, but we have a floating currency. So something smells fishy, right? And, and this is how you should be thinking, right? Always question the things. You know, I hear the term depreciation and appreciation. I don't hear that term. I hear devaluation. But our currency is a floating currency. So I should be hearing the term appreciation or depreciation. But for some reason, our floating currency stays with a, a selling rate of 679, 6.795. They might change the third number, 6.794, 6.792, but it's 6.79, but it floats in. It's supposed to change every day based on the demand. We saw that a few slides ago. So here's what. You all feel free to ask questions. I love economics. I, I love this thing. Um, I really love economics. I'm passionate about it, as you can tell. I, I didn't start out wanting to be an economist. I did physics, chemistry, and biology, and all them things for what you all call now sec and then for, for advanced level which you all call cape now i wanted to do econ i realized i fell in love with a course called, called principles of business and i wanted to do that so i dropped out i've dropped the sciences after i left the csec level or the cxc level and picked up the um the the econ from there and i love it so i get very excited and animated when i'm talking about it so and hopefully your parents can be listening because we're going to talk about the implications here for gas prices. Um, now, we're talking about the real effective exchange rate, right? 
Now, the real effective exchange rate, again, we're making the adjustments. It's not the nominal effective exchange rate, it's the real effective exchange rate. Um, what we have found, what we find here with real effective exchange rates is that they're sustained over valuations, meaning that our currency is overvalued. And that creates problems because uh, overvaluations are, is a signal of a currency crash. And we don't want to have that because we wouldn't be able to buy a foreign currency, not even if we want to. We might even be able to buy the Guyanese dollar or the, the, the Jamaican dollar, right? So we don't want that, but we will see the impending dangers that we have with our current situation and our real effective exchange rate, right? Because if you maintain the real effective exchange rate at the wrong level, you can create this distortions in the market eh, of traded goods and non-traded goods. And what does that mean? You can actually end up paying less for a foreign good than you actually should be paying. That increases the demand for the foreign currency which puts pressure on the central bank to maintain the currency at that value in terms of the buying and the selling. So it's almost as if when we have that overvaluation, it's almost as if the government is subsidizing the importation of foreign goods. You hear me? The importation of foreign goods is subsidized when your currency is overvalued. So it means that wherein you should be paying, let's say, $20 for a good, you're actually paying $15 because the currency is overvalued. So it appears the currency is very strong when in fact the currency, if allowed to do its own business, might actually be very weak. So in, if you allow the currency to do what it has to do and you get it to the really effective exchange rate, which is the equilibrium exchange rate, then instead of paying $20 for the good, you might end up paying $30 for the good and that could create problems. So we are creating a false demand for foreign goods. And but you hear the discussion in the, in, in, the, in the governments, all governments. Oh, Trinidadians like foreign goods. Well, yeah, if the currency overvalued and I, you subsidizing me purchasing a foreign good, well, I will purchase it. Just like if you subsidize in my education and you giving me gate to get tertiary education free, of course I'm going. But if I have to pay it, I might think twice. But if we had to pay the correct price for the foreign currency, we will have equilibrium demand and not a false simulation of demand for foreign goods, which puts pressure on the currency, which puts pressure on the central bank to maintain the value of the currency, <clears throat> right? Because there's increased demand. So hence, you're seeing all of these restrictions in the foreign currency is because of the false demand, the, well, the overstimulation of demand based on that subsidized value because our currency is overvalued and we'll see how that creates problems. You all follow me here. Give me a nod. Give me a yes. Give me an amen. Something is Saturday morning. Mind you, this is not coffee. This is tea. You all with me so far? Give me a yes now. Tell me something in the chat. With me so far? Let me start calling some names. Cameron, you with me? All right. All right. Good. So you're with me. Good. Very nice. If you, if you, if at any time you feel you, if you think something different to what I say, feel free to do so. I always tell people that's the only way learning can take place is if you challenge the teacher standing in front of you based on your understanding. You can challenge the teacher. Don't just get up and say, I don't agree. Tell me why you don't agree. <clears throat> and we'll have an academic discussion, right? There's nothing wrong with telling me, I don't agree with you, Darren. By the way, don't feel you had to call me so or nothing. I try to convince everybody. My name is Darren. In a time and place, is Dr. Conrad, but in the classroom, I prefer to be called Darren. So if you have a question, um, open your mic, raise your hand, feel free to call me Darren. This is, this is just who I am. Um, so we're moving on, we move in. So we see we have problems here. Now let's talk about Trinidad and Tobago and how we arrive at this current exchange rate regime that we have, All right? So we'll do a little history here, history lesson in, in foreign currency. Let me um, just double check something here. I have a question for you, but I'm checking to see if I'm at that point where I'm ready for that question. Yeah. 
So we had a we've been having this discussion. So I'm going to take a poll here now. Um and I want to hear from you based on our discussion so far. You see, this is how I know if you listen to me or if you watching TV while you or you're doing your chores or you on WhatsApp or you're on YouTube or Facebook while we're talking. I ain't accusing anybody of anything, eh? I'm guilty as charged. I sometimes end up in meetings finding myself doing something other than uh, paying attention to what's going on. So we're humans. So I'm posting a poll in the chat here. So you click on that poll and you tell me what you feel and you give me your response and we'll see your responses real time, right? So come on, everybody, we have, we don't have a whole lot of people, so we should see so nice, all of everybody should be responding, right? You can't hide behind the numbers now. That's the beauty about not having a hundred people, right? So you, you, you post in there, tell me, you type your name in and don't, don't um, be shy. Tell me what, what prices do you, do exchange rates affect? Imported goods, okay. Exports, correct. Correct is right according to them. Or as, as, as young people would say, facts. Come on, let's see some more responses. For those of you who joined us a little bit late, thank you still for coming. Um, and um, we hope you enjoyed the morning with us. Imports, exports. Okay, if you don't type it in that, you can type it in the chat too, you know. Roger, thanks. Thanks for putting it there. That reminded me that you could put it in the chat. Imports, exports, of course. Investment. Uh-huh. I'm seeing it. <clears throat> and then this word cloud here, you see the predominant uh, uh, word is good, right? Well, it's goods, trade goods, everything. Good. Keep putting, keep posting. Post a few more. Let me see how this cloud will look out. I ain't hear nobody voice yet. Don't worry, I'll, I'll find a way to make you talk and open mic and talk. Don't worry. Exports, goods imported, uh-huh. So we see we get in the key terms, right? Put some more, anybody else want to put, put some more, man. Ah, I see gas come up there a little bigger. Uh-huh. Yes, of course. Now, as you raise that, is, that issue there, and I'm seeing gas, which is very interesting. Foreign direct investment, absolutely, Roger, absolutely. Now, as you raise that issue there, and you broach that issue, this one you might have to type in the chat or activate your mic to tell me this one. Why it is now the price of gas being affected by the exchange rate? <clears throat> Why? I mean, you know the answer, I know the answer. But I want to hear from you. Why is now gas being affected by the exchange rate? That was not a discussion before, you know. That was never a discussion in Trinidad vernacular. Never. But it is now. Why? Don't let me start calling names now. Eh? Gas is now a discussion when we talk about exchange rates. Why? Come on, at least one person. Cut, cut me some slack here now. Ah, thank you, Roger. And uh, now everyone can see Roger's um, response because we're importing gas now. <coughs> Who can disagree with that? Anyone disagrees with that? Say, say, tell me if you disagree with that. Or if you agree with it, say agreed. Type agreed if you agree with that. Say because we're importing gas now. No, 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 mind you. We're removing the subsidies on fuel and we're subject to exchange rates, right? Changes in the exchange rate. 
So now that it's not subsidized, if the currency should devalue, we not driving is bicycle because we can't buy gas. <laughs> Yesterday I went to fill up my tank. I mean, I think it was the gas fumes, but I got a headache. I, I, I think it was the gas fumes. All right, well, thank you for responding. For those of you who responded and typing in the chat. Um, uh, in, um, I remember going to Barbados and I pulled into the gas station and I was driving a car, a rental, and I pulled into the gas station and I said, fill it up. Lily filled up the tank. She told me, um, 180 Barbados dollars. I looked at the lady and my mouth opened eh? My mouth opened to say, take it out. <laughs> but I said, look, <laughs> that is madness. $180 to fill up the tank. Man, I drive around that whole island. Because I say I was determined that I'm going to see and use up all the gas that I put in there. $180 Barbados dollars to fill the gas tank. And it was a, was a station wagon. It wasn't even a SUV. But anyway, I so in Barbados, they call gas tear gas. So I said, well, why do they call it tear gas? They said, because every time you go to buy gas, you shed a tear. So they call gas in Barbados tear gas. I was like, okay, but we have it, have it. We still have it nicer because our price of fuel is relatively low compared to other countries because we're looking at, you know, $3, not even $10, um, nine something. But in the U.S. is four something U.S. So we still, but we're dollar for dollar. We're going up, you know, we're aging up. But, but we'll hope for the best. So let's talk about the evolution. Thank you, Roger. Thank, and thank you, everybody else <clears throat> for, for, for participating in that poll. And, um, and yes, of course, we know we'll get to more about this important gas now. So tell, tell, <laughs> tell your parents, the story ain't done yet with this gas price, right? Because if anything happens to the currency value, which I, it, it, it must happen, um, we will be looking at even more for fuel. So we might want to look to alternatives. I, I can't tell, tell you take public transportation because that's a whole nother story right there. We know waiting on a bus is, is tantamount to wasting time. You could turn into a skeleton waiting on a bus. But anyway, um, so in Trinidad, the exchange rate, the, the exchange rate regime has evolved. We started off with the um with the fixed exchange rate in the 60s, and then the government decided, look, we're going to abolish this. And in 1993, we're going to move to a managed float. A managed float, not a free float, a managed float. Because if it was a free float, we'd be we they think we'd be in trouble. But I'll show you why we'll not be in trouble. And um, that happened in 1993. So in the 60s, that's why up until the early 90s. It was um, $2.75, not the early 90s, uh, probably the late 80s. It was $2.75 per US. Um, and, but of course, you couldn't just go and buy currency over the counter. You had to go with your ticket. And, uh, you still had to go now because, of course, you understand why we have to go with the ticket now. Because they're trying to place a little bit of restrictions to kind of stifle the demand for the foreign goods based on the overvaluation of the currency. Um, and then when we moved to a managed float to hoping for the better outcome, and that's when we went from 275 to five something. Now we at 679. And the transition wasn't difficult. Um, and the government decided to abolish the controls and uh, have the value of the Trinidad and Tobago dollar be determined by in terms of the interbank. Remember, with the fixed exchange rate, the central bank manages the value of that currency. But now we go on with the managed float, we sort of based on the, the market now, the foreign exchange market or the interbank market, which determines the value of the, the demand on the interbank market. So it again, look at here. You see how we're making confusion here now? The value of the Trinidad and Tobago dollar appreciates or depreciates. <laughs> Remember, that's when we're talking about a floating exchange rate, right? It appreciates or depreciates in the response to a change in demand and supply for the foreign exchange and the intervention policy of the central bank. So we're talking about a floating exchange rate where we up currency value appreciates or it depreciates. 
but we're always talking about now the valuation. So you're talking about two sides of your mouth. We're talking about the currency as a flexible exchange rate or floating, which is appreciation or depreciation. And then out of this side, we're talking about the valuation, which relates to a fixed exchange rate. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we don't know what we're talking about. We, we can, we're conflating everything now, not us, not the economists. We're clear on this. The politicians, I don't think they understand the difference between a fixed and a floating, and the terms that are used with the floating is appreciation and depreciation, and the term used with fixed is devaluation. So I think they're not too clear on what, what is, and I'm not surprised, but anyway, that's a whole different story right there. Um, so I decided to, upon myself, I am going to find out <clears throat> what is going to happen if the currency is devalued. Now, I say devalued because it's overvalued. So I asked the question, is the Trinidad and Tobago currency really overvalued and the extent to the report and to the extent outlined in the IMF Article 4? Well, you know, of course, IMF always here doing the Article 4 consultations. The most recent one here was just completed. On the surface, it's looking good, but the IMF saying a whole lot in a very few words. You have to really read, not between the lines, but between each word that they write. Because remember, they don't want to create upheaval. But things not looking too good for us on the horizon if we don't make some quick changes. Um, and this was based, I looked at the IMF 2016 report when they, come, when they came out and they said, <clears throat> the currency overvalued and you need to devalue. That was the talk then. It's still the talk. It's, a, it's not the, that was a big blow up. But the talk now about devaluation is just murmurings, murmurings and rumblings. But when you see his rumblings, it's like just before the volcano erupt, you're hearing the rumblings and the rumblings and it going to, it going to, at some point it will. That's where we're going with this currency. And that's why I'm afraid that we have a little problem here. So I looked at, I compared the nominal exchange rate and the real effective exchange rate. Now, they never seem to align. Of course, we don't expect them to, but they move in the same general direction, which is good. That's a good sign. So remember in economics, we plot everything and we chart everything to see if it's telling the same story. So it tells a similar story, right? The real effective exchange rate. <clears throat> now, when you're looking at the nominal exchange rate and real effective exchange rate, it tells you different things, right? Um, I mean, talk about some of those things. But what I paid more attention to was the currency alignment or misalignment. Are we at the equilibrium exchange rate or are we overvalued or undervalued? This chart here tells us, what does this tell us? Well, let me look at it in words. Since 2014, go back to the chart. Since 2014, our currency has been overvalued. Not now. And the average overvaluation is 5.66% with a peak of 9.5% in 2015. So our currency is overvalued by between six and, well, let's round it off, between six and 10%. That's a lot. We ain't talking about currency value in terms of how it affects prices, right? Um, so what is happening? there what does that mean it means that our demand for goods are extremely high foreign goods because of this overvaluation and again i go back to my same concept like the government subsidizing the purchase of foreign goods but they're telling you buy local how are you going to tell me buy local when you put subsidizing basically based on an overvalued currency you subsidizing foreign goods you telling me buy local so i must be dumb dumb no you're telling me buy local, but you subsidize any purchase of foreign goods. You're not subsidizing the purchase of local goods. You're taking off the subsidy on the fuel, but you're not even subsidizing the food or buying locally, but you're subsidizing the food or buying and the, and the clothes are buying foreign, right? Based on the overvaluation. So it's almost like the government giving you a 6 and 10% discount on foreign goods. Yeah, that's what it is. In real layman terms, that is what it is. They subsidize any purchase of foreign goods. And telling you buy local, no, you could get you're not going and get 10% off of a local good. You're not going to get seven six percent off of a local good. 
but you're getting six and ten percent of our foreign good, right? So <clears throat> the, this has a negative impact on economic growth in Trinidad, and everybody trying to figure out well why we not growing and we the writing on the wall, so to speak, right? So now the real exchange rate again represents the rate at which domestic goods are traded for foreign goods. And that affects our net exports. Remember our current account balances. Eh? So the higher the real exchange rate, the lower the net exports. So how we can run a trade surplus? We will always run a trade deficit because you're bringing in more goods than you're selling. Right? Good. So the nominal exchange rate, of course, we come back to this. What determines the exchange rate? The nominal exchange rate, the value of a currency, is determined by the supply and demand in the foreign exchange market. So it's all about demand and supply. Look, anytime anybody asks you a question in economics, it's always about demand and supply. And I have a smile on my face for this, but it's true. It's always about demand and supply. Demand and supply of the foreign currency and the local currency, that determines the value of the currency. The demand for the foreign currency determines the value of our currency. Right? How much of how much of our currency are we willing to give up to get a foreign currency because we want that good so bad? Right? <clears throat> so where is the central bank in all of this? Remember, I said if the rate is fixed, the central bank has to manage this whole process. So where is the central bank in all of this? Well, this came from the central bank's website. The bank is responsible for the management of the foreign exchange market in the public's interest, not the government interest, in the public interest, in the tax paying public interest under the Exchange Control Act. So this is why the central bank comes in now in terms of authorizing the dealers of foreign exchange and who can buy and sell foreign exchange. And that includes the central banks, the commercial banks and non-bank financial institutions, right? Who can buy and sell currency is determined by the central bank in the interest of the public in order to manage the foreign exchange market, right? So let's look at a little thing here now and um, a little video to, to sum up what we've done so far. And we'll see how we are on this spectrum. Share sound, share, boom. Good. <laughs> Recent headlines raise concerns about the strong U.S. dollar. Many factors can cause one currency to rise while another falls, and understanding the complexities is not easy. So who or what causes currency swings? You already know someone with influence in the process. Just look in the mirror. You might not be an international banker, but you have more involvement with foreign currency exchange than you might realize. When you go shopping at a neighborhood store, you exchange your local money for Indian rupees Mexican pesos, Chinese yuan, and many other currencies, at least indirectly. As consumers like you raise demand for one currency over another, that currency gets stronger. Here's how it works. If a country produces something you want, such as a Swiss watch, you must sell your local currency and buy Swiss francs to obtain the item. You can travel to Switzerland and buy the watch directly, or you can have an importer do it for you. Another way is to let your neighborhood store act between you and the importer, removing you one step further from the exchange. Regardless, somewhere along the line, someone has to buy Swiss francs before you get the watch. When you consider the manufacturing process, you see that even more currencies are involved. Maybe the Swiss watchmaker imported its silver from one country, like Mexico, and the leather from another, like Brazil. In the 21st century economy, almost all supply chains are global. Every time raw materials, parts, or labor move across borders, one currency must be sold and another must be purchased. Having a strong currency works to your advantage when you buy an imported product because you get more for less, but it works against you when you want to sell overseas because it raises prices and shrinks the market. If you are like most consumers, you don't get involved with export, but a strong local currency can still hurt you because it lowers corporate profits and creates headwinds for the entire economy. The bottom line, having a strong local currency is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways.
right. So that in two minutes and hi, I'm Adrian Hill. And I'm Jacob. Oh, Clifford, oh, welcome to Crash. Oh, gosh, gosh. Right. So there, my friends, we have a, a, had that little review there. And it said a lot in a few seconds. And what it said, we, we are the ones responsible for the strong US dollar, right? So we're talking about all oh, the currency value high, but we are the ones, why? Because we indirectly keep the US dollar strong by having a high demand for US produced goods. When there's a high demand for US produced goods, there's a high demand for the US currency. So you have to exchange your currency for the US currency to purchase the US goods that we want. So the US dollar will remain strong, <coughs> excuse me. And there we have it. As the, as the video said, look in the mirror. But we can't, we always ready to blame someone else, but we, are the ones who really determine the price of goods and services. Look at KFC. Not supposed to call names of things. I stopped doing that in the class. A particular franchise started charging a price for condiments. And the consumers decided we're not paying for it. You could keep your ketchup. I will bring my ketchup. I will bring my pepper sauce. And what did that franchise have to do? They repealed the charge for the condiments and went back to the good old ways of letting you take what you want. So the consumer has the power because we're the ones doing the buying. We're the ones who, as we said, every time you spend a dollar, you make a vote, you cast a vote. You have voted for that product. So you will see certain products all the time because why? We continuously vote for that and we demand that. But by virtue of so doing, we keep the U.S. currency very strong and we end up paying more for it. The demand for the U.S. currency is high. Hold on. So we have some ongoing fiscal challenges. And when I say ongoing fiscal challenges, these fiscal challenges did not start yesterday. They started years ago, right? Now, since 20, 2009, we have been spending more money than we collected in tax revenue as a country. Mind you, Trinidad and Tobago's GDP is 20 billion US a year. That is not a small, uh, a small amount for 1.3 million people. That's a huge economy we have. We have a huge economy. It's not a matter of what we make, you know, it's what we do with it. Our GDP, my friends, I said, is 20 billion US a year. Is not, the problem is not how much we make it, it's what we're doing with it. So what we do with it? Transfers and subsidies make up more than half of our recurrent expenditure since 2008. Here we are in 2022, and we still have the same fiscal position. More than half of our expenditure as a country, not ours, the country's expenditure goes on transfers and subsidies. What's that? Subsidy for fuel, subsidy for water, subsidy for electricity, subsidy for education, subsidy for healthcare. <coughs> the average household in Trinidad receives in excess of $5,000 per month in subsidies. You hear what I'm telling you? The average household in Trinidad re receives more than $5,000 a month in subsidies, subsidized water, subsidized fuel, subsidized electricity so to us we walk into a room and we turn the lights on ain't no big thing you walk out and you leave it on you're going to shower and you, you know you want hot water so you let the water run until you get hot but if you have the electric water it, it works it's more efficient we're wasting brushing your teeth you turn on the tap and you brushing on the water running let me tell you, I learned the hard way how to conserve our resources. And I didn't learn it here. I was spoiled here. I learned it when I traveled. I was in Ireland. 
and I want to take a shower, you know, I was traveling to North and uh, Northern Ireland in, in the Belfast region. And so you had to stop and I stayed in this hostel because I didn't want to stray you're approaching Belfast. Those of you who know the history of Belfast, you didn't want to vent you out too far. It still have a little tension there. They gave me this token. So I put the token in and turn on the water. Well, I get ready to bathe. So I go in and bathe. Wet my skin, the water nice and warm. Soap up my skin. Boom. Water cut off. I say, but what, what's going on here? I, I, I soaked up. And I in the shower. Can't come out. Well, I wipe off my... I use the towel and wipe off the soap so I feel it's sticky. Why go on to the front? That's what happened. Oh, the token is only for a certain amount. If you want more, you have to pay for another token. I not pay for another token. So the next morning, one token, I jump in there, wet my skin, soap, rinse, quick, quick, not more than three minutes. No, you know nobody in bed in three minutes. Yeah, we had a they had to play wasting the resources because why it's subsidized right same thing with electricity we waste it yes we waste it we, we, we have the electric things running and we're not even in the room right air condition running and you're not even in the house we're wasting the, 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 the energy we're wasting the energy if we need to conserve it now if we were paying the actual price and not the subsidized price bet you we use it judiciously right so with these transfers and subsidies, I'm not saying that they're not supposed to get them. Eh? I'm saying is that we need to be mindful of who gets it. Not everyone should get it. And then we have low fiscal buffers. Low fiscal buffers means we don't have the fiscal space should we have a natural disaster. It's a good thing we country pays insurance for natural disaster um, damage and, and, and so on. So when you see there's a a major flood or something and the government says oh they're giving out or they're paying out money to people and they're giving out mattresses or they're buying this and giving to people we pay insurance for that so we get uh we get we have coverage so when we get the money from the insurance company um is a regional arrangement then we can use the money for those things but it has to be used for those things because we pay an insurance premium every month or whether well, they pay monthly or annually so we get we have coverage but outside of that we have no fiscal space for anything to go wrong and then of course our debt to gdp ratio is 68 percent so every dollar the government earns in revenue 68 cents goes to the payment of the interest on the debt that we owe we ain't actually principal yet so we borrow to the end nth degree and so we're in trouble unless we get that under control. So you see why we have no fiscal space. The story goes on. Of course, I apologize for this. I justified all the slides. And so you see the so place of fiscal consolidation that, that I've gotten all over there. I didn't see it fly all over there, brought it back, <clears throat> right? So the so place of fiscal consolidation. So we have challenges that, and these challenges, my friends, did not just start, as I said. Remember I told you we'll be doing the application part of it, right? So our expenditure is more than revenue. At the personal level, if you are spending more than you are earning, you're in trouble, right? It means you have to borrow. And who you're borrowing from? Whoever will lend you. The bank may not lend you, but the money lender may. So you go to the money lender. Oh gosh, people here, admin, right? So as I said, you have to borrow because you're spending more. So do we depreciate? Or do we, what do we do? As I said, we have a de facto float. We still managing this float to a certain extent to keep it steady. But the currency is overvalued. I told you already, overvalued in some instances, 6% and 10%. So we need to get the currency aligned. But now, how do we go about devaluing this currency? Without creating problems. Because if we're talking about devaluing, it means the value of the currency, my friends, is not going to be a significant increase there. I mean, it will have a significant impact in terms of the nominal <laughs> value. It will be a big increase, right? We're talking about a six, between a 6 and 10%. If we take the average of that, it will be what? What's the average of the 6 and the 10? Eight. Right? Oh, yes. 
16, 8 and 8, 16. Oh, Lord, I have to use my calculator. <laughs> we rest for it. Um, so we're talking about an 8% increase. And if we are saying that the value of the currency is, let's say, 6.79 multiplied by 0 0.08, we're talking about a 54 cent increase in the, dollar, in, the, in the value of the currency, yeah? So 54 cents. So instead of paying 678, we would be paying $7.32. So when you hear people out there calling random numbers, like 10 and $12, wrong. The, based on the research, and it's scientific and it's robust. You can go and read it. It's available online. It's by Darren Conrad. And, I, and I will, you'll get the slides and you'll see the title of it. Exchange Rate Misalignment in Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> so technically, if they devalue the currency, the, we, we will now be paying $7.32 for US. Now, that's not a whole lot, but it's a, it will do a lot of damage because of our, now we will see a fall off in the demand for foreign goods. Save and accept, we have another challenge. The demand for foreign goods has become inelastic and you have your elasticity as an elasticity vector next week. It is, has become inelastic. So when the prices go up for the foreign good, we are still going to want it because we are of the opinion that the foreign good is a better quality. Well, might be, have, might be onto something here. But we have to develop a sense of that commitment to a domestic market if we want to really be strong in terms of a manufacturing sector, right? If we demand a better quality locally, you will get the better quality, just like the consumers demanded the removal of that condiment price by not paying it. <clears throat> you, could, you could demand, the, 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 well, we're already doing it, but they're not responding, but we can make them respond if there are certain things in place, right? So we have different, uh, what we call them, approaches to, to looking at the effect of this devaluation, which technically is a, we're using these things interchangeably and we're getting confused as a, as a country. So we're using the elasticity approach, which is the, price, the relative price effects of depreciation suggesting the impact is greatest when the elasticity is high. Remember I said demand is inelastic. If the demand is highly elastic, by, but to make it highly elastic, we must have near or perfect substitutes, right? Of a similar quality, of a similar grade. Then we have the absorption approach, where domestic expenditure relative to income <clears throat> must occur to promote trade equilibrium. And then we have the monetary approach, which emphasizes the effect of depreciation on the purchasing power. So what does all of that mean? Remember I told you we have to have the perfect storm in order for devaluation or, well, devaluation to make sense because as far as I am concerned, is a managed float is basically, as the IMF said, is a de facto float, which is a dirty float in layman's terms, right? So we have a dirty float, hence the overvaluation of the currency. Um, now, what would happen is when the currency becomes, if we, really the value and let the currency, let the market determine what the value is on a daily basis, because the demand is so high, that $7 and how much cents and 30 something cents will quickly move to 10 if the demand stays high for foreign goods. Because remember now demand is going to determine the price of the foreign, the, of our, the value of our domestic currency relative to another current or foreign currency. So, so the elasticity of demand is the responsiveness of the buyers to the price, the change in price. Of course, you know the formula. A percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price, right? So we have, and we use the same measures here. A elastic is greater than one, inelastic less than one, and a unit elasticity equal to one. So that's the elasticity approach. For, um, and we're talking about the absolute values, remember? For because the demand curve is a, negative slope, elasticity will always give you a negative value. So you take the absolute value, which is you ignore the minus sign. You all know that already. So with the elasticity approach, there's a Marshall learner condition where if <clears throat> elasticity is greater than one for foreign goods, sorry, did you, 
Depreciation will improve trade balances if the nation's demand for elasticity demand elasticity for imports plus foreign demand elasticity for the exports is greater than one. Right? So we're saying that it will improve the trade balances, but for elastic, for elast where elasticity is greater than one, meaning the demand is elastic. If the demand is elastic, something has to happen on the supply side, right? We'll get to that. Now, if it is inelastic, it will worsen our trade balance. And that is point two. It will worsen our trade balances. Remember, I told you our demand for foreign goods is inelastic. So we're in trouble either way, right? We have an economy that's contracting quicker than I mean, we can do and then we can react. And then we have the issue now of the foreign markets. Then we have things we have no control over. <clears throat> so not only do we have the challenge with the um, the current crisis with the oil, which is being created now by Russia and Ukraine, we also have the issue of wheat. And we also have the issue of a byproduct for fertilizer. So if there's a shortage of wheat, means we're going to have a shortage of fertilizer, means we're going to have a shortage of everything, means that the prices are going to go up. So by the middle of next year, we can expect to see significant increases in the price of flour, which means the price of bread will go up again. So we're going to see this knock-on effect year on year on for years to come of constant increases in prices in the global markets because we're not going we purchase the, the we import the the, the 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 flour the wheat to make the flour and the ukraine and russia produces 30 percent of the world supply of wheat of which they did not get an opportunity to plant their crop this year so they have no nothing to reap next year trouble all around we don't have control over these things, but we can prepare in anticipation of, we know this is going to happen. Do we wait until there's a shortage of wheat to say, now the price of wheat gone up, now the price of flour gone up, now the price of bread gone up, not just bread, all the products in the bakery will go up. Do we wait until then or do we act now? Our problem is we slow to act. We act when it becomes a crisis. So if there's a problem, Trinidad do so. It ain't reached me yet. When it reaches you, it's too late to react. So the consumers now will face it. Yes, sir, we have no increases in incomes. Uh, nobody asking me no question. Come on, man. Talk, talk. Put something in the chat. Give me something to ask and uh, answer to. So now, of course, if it's unit elasticity, we don't have to worry about nothing. For nothing will change. Our position will stay the same. Now, what happens? <clears throat> There's a J curve effect. Every time I do this, I feel like Donald Trump. No. <laughs> I try to keep stop doing it because he does that a lot, right? So anyway, um, the J curve says when there's depreciation, you will see a decline. It's it's just as the, as the name implies. You see the letter J, the curve shaped like a J. So we will have a decline, and then we will see an improvement in the balances of trade. That's all it says, right? But again, that's the elasticity approach. Then we have the we have to deal with lags. So this is our problem in Trinidad. The lag. How long do you how long do you realize before you realize a change in competitiveness exists? So that's called the recognition lag. How long you stay in denial before you recognize something is happening and we need to act? Then we have the decision lag. Need I say? You watch the news, you read the news, you hear the news. How long it takes us to make a decision on something? Goodness gracious, even the issue with crime. When I hear the acting commissioner of police come before the nation and say, what what is it, buddy? Um, something about what? He's, he's, I, I, I can't even remember the exact words, but he basically in shock that this, the, the murder and, and um, rate has risen so quickly. But you the one who want to fix it. Don't be in shock. Fix it. Let me be in shock. I have no control over it. But you have you direct control over the, the, the resources to address the issue, but you you surprise, you dismay. Mm, I'll tell you. Then we have the, the, the delivery lag right between if you depreciate the value of the currency now the demand for your goods becomes high 
because you're good now cheap. So you a good substitute because you're producing something good. So you the, the foreigners, they say, all right, we want goods from Trinidad. But how long can you, how do you have the mechanisms in place to increase the, 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 the uh, supply? Then we have replacement. You need to use up inventories, then you bring in again, and the whole motion, the whole mechanism has to react. And then we have the production lag. How long before you can produce more? Right? So imagine this. I went up to Maracas St. Joseph. No, not Maracas St. Joseph. I talk about where I live in now. <laughs> Maracas on the lookout. And um, I stopped to buy plum. Chow. It didn't even, it must have had, I, I didn't count the amount of plum because it was so, I, I, I don't think it was 10 plum. Must it, must it 10? $10 for a bag of plum. So I asked the guy, I said, wait, you couldn't put more plum in the bag. Hey man, tell me, but this is not plum from Trinidad, this is plum from Grenada. I, I grew up climbing plum tree and falling out plum tree. Why we have to bring plum from Grenada? So you important plum? So I called the meat shop now to place my order because I order meats from the meat shop. UE Farms, precisely, because UE Farms does have premium grade meats there. You could let your parents know. They could get meats from UE Farms and it's much cheaper than the supermarket. So I, I order my goat. Hey, lady, tell me, um, Dr. Conrad, I must let you know that is um, imported goat. I say, scratch goat off because I know once you use the term imported, the price high. So I am trying to figure out what happened to the goats in Trinidad. Like, what happened to our, what happened to our sec agricultural sector? Are we failing, we can't even, we can't even make plum chow locally. Come on, man. So could we increase production at short notice? Now, our problem is we don't have complete pass through, right? In terms of if we have a devaluation, what we have in Trinidad is a partial pass through. In that the change in the import price is less than the percentage change in the export, in the, in the exchange rate, sorry. <clears throat> so we have a partial pass through. If you have a partial pass through, devaluation is going to have a negative impact on economic growth. You have to have a full pass through, right? The exchange rate is critical, yes. Devaluation can accomplish certain things. And as I said, there must be certain conditions present for devaluation to have a positive effect on economic growth. Yes, you'll see that J-curve effect where you'll see a decline and then an up increase. But one of the conditions necessary is complete pass-through in that import prices change in full proportion to the exchange rate. But we have partial, so we will have a problem. Right, and you can see in this table here the pass through rate for every one percent a currency depreciates, the price of imports increases or decreases by a certain amount. Right, <clears throat> so we must have full pass through, that's one of the conditions. But we have partial pass through in Trinidad. So, one now, why do we have partial pass through? One, our invoicing practices by foods. So, if conducting international trade. Invoice exports in a foreign currency changes the exchange rate. Changes in the exchange rate will not cause the prices to change immediately. So we're we talking about the lags. This is one of the problems, right? The invoicing practices is one of the problems. Market share considerations. Firms may elect to change prices by a lesser proportion to maintain market share. In other words, you don't want your profit compromised. So you're going to... <clears throat> You're going to change your prices by a lesser proportion than the changes in the current the exchange rate or the currency value. So you want to take the hit in order for you to maintain market share. So we have that. And then distribution costs. When the import reaches the border, there's additional costs, right? We have transportation, marketing, wholesaling, and retailing, which is denominated in the home currency. So that's why we have partial pass-through and not full pass-through. So any type of devaluation. Major problems, even if it's just from 679 to 732. <clears throat> then we have the absorption approach, right? So the impact of, now you all know this. Right? 
what is the most prominent type of time lag in Trinidad? Recognition. Johansi, recognition. As I said, we don't act in, the, in Trinidad until it becomes a crisis. You know, you would see things happening globally and the mentality is, nah, that ain't reached me yet, man. That ain't reached the source here yet, man. So we good. But no, we're not good because we, live, we are an open economy. So our major lag is the recognition lag. Then that is followed by the decision lag. What are legislators going to do? Are they going to stand up in parliament and talk ad infinitum or are they going to pass the law, uh, have the law, the president do whatever she has to do, they say the ascension or something like that, and then implement. So it's one thing to pass the law. We may pass the law, but we didn't implement it. Right? How long we've been talking about revenue authority? Has it been implemented yet? How long are we talking about property taxes? You know, so we 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 don't recognize when we do recognize, we we don't we hesitate to act. We're very hesitant to act. So that it is. Sorry about that. I didn't see that question posted. I just heard. So we again we have the recognition lag followed by the decision lag. Right? Outside of that, we have capacity, right? We have capacity to increase production and so on because we have manpower. That's the most important thing. We have human capital. We have skill, semi-skill, and lo a low skill, right? So we have human capital available at, uh, and I keep saying human capital is new gold, but nobody wants to utilize the human capital in a meaningful way. Ask me what natural resource China has, human capital. They don't have no natural resource, coal. Outside of that, China and Singapore has brain power and they are able to grow by converting that brain power and monetizing it. We can do the same, right? So we have the impact of depreciation. And of course, the impact of depreciation is going to be felt on the net export side, which is the exports minus imports, but also the absorption is the consumption, investment, and government spending, which is the C plus I plus G. And the the net exports, of course, is the B. So we're looking at absorption. So now we have output is absorption plus net exports. And of course, the B is the income minus the absorption. So the currency depreciation will improve trade balances if output rises relative to absorption. And that is where we can utilize the human capital in case we, did. we were trying to figure out where we could go with that, right? <clears throat> so. Now, this is tricky, and that is why I say we can utilize the human capital here, because an economy at full employment is unlikely to see substantial changes, all right, in trade balances. But we have an abundance. We don't, we are not operating at full unemployment. What we're operating at is full underemployment. <laughs> That's my term, man. It's a general term like that. But that is, a, that is where we can utilize our human capital to impact our exchange rate and our trade balances, believe it or not. It's that simple. How are we doing for time? All right, 1026. At, so then we have finally the monetary approach. And this suggests depreciation will lead to a temporary improvement in balance of payments. It will alter the demand for money, which will alter the inflows and outflows. But is that going to be permanent? So over time, depreciation on changes will have an effect on changes or only affect changes over time depreciation only changes the domestic price level, right? But it doesn't change <clears throat> anything else in a meaningful way on a sustained way. So here is our position. We're coming back to the real effective exchange rate and the equilibrium. We have an equilibrium, but we said since 2014, our currency has been overvalued. This is for reinforcement, right? Repetition is the mother of retention. Our currency has been overvalued since 2014 with the highest of 9 point, well, 10%, 9.55 something percent, with the highest of 10% in 2015 and thereafter the lowest of 6%. So if we, again, if we take the average of that, our currency has been overvalued to the tune of 8%. So instead of paying, 679 for a US dollar, we should actually pay $7.34. Maybe more, but scientifically, I could pinpoint 
$27.34 as a definitive value. That's a benchmark value. Now, the demand <coughs> for the foreign goods will determine where we go from there, right? So I did. I stopped short of, in this study because I did not calculate the demand for foreign goods. But maybe I can take this paper another step further and calculate the demand for foreign goods and see what that will add to the 7.35 or 34 in terms of an increase. Now imagine that that little increase there could come as a an eight percent, a eight percent. I say if we overvalued to the tune of between six and ten percent, right? So we divided the currency, and so now the price of the import goes up by eight percent. That includes fuel prices. So combined with the increase in the, in the cost of the importation of fuel, with the repeal of the subsidy, we ain't finished the gas story yet. This gas story is going to go on for a while, right? So again, we've been overvalued. Now, this is where I picked it up from. I picked it up from 2016. But in actuality, we have been overvalued since we've been in existence partly because we pegged on a nominal exchange rate system. So it's our adoption, it's our own policies that created problems. And nobody created these problems for us with our currency value. We created these problems ourselves in terms of what policy approaches we took. Now, I started, remember I told you, I started from the 2016 IMF, con, um, uh, IMF, what do you call it? The consultation, Article 4 consultation. But this has been going on prior to, since the 60s. And... <clears throat> So our exchange rate appreciated for the period 1982 to 1985 by 29%. On account of, now I tell you, appreciated on account of the increase in the price of oil. That's when we were exporting fuel. So that boom, which we experienced in the 70s, or what we call it is a, a windfall, that is part of our problem. It appreciated the currency value, but based on our oil, on a globally determined oil price. Now, when the oil prices came down, so our currency value depreciated instead of. So it appreciated significantly. You know what's an appreciation of it? That's why we could have been paying $2.75 for a US. We had oil. Now we have none. Um, so there was a drastic devaluation post 1986. And that is where, again, oil prices fell. So we, wherever oil prices went, we went as an economy. So when oil prices go up, we happy. When oil prices come down, we have, we sad. Um, and then again, as I said, it's not the money that we make. Our economy is still 20 billion US dollars for 1.3. The GDP per capita in Trinidad is th between 13 and 14,000 US right? GDP per capita, 13 and 14,000 US a year. <clears throat> now, again, there was an undervaluation, but we recovered quicker because of a favorable economic climate. Now we live in an uncertain economic climate. We didn't even start to talk about COVID yet because that's a whole nother lecture. So we just keep into the basics, but you can factor in in your own intellectual capacity where COVID took us in this whole process, right? And then, of course, during the period 2002 to 2008, we had the undervaluation. Now, remember I said it, our currency has never been at equilibrium value. It's always been a falsely overvalued. <clears throat> and when it's undervalued, we try to quickly bring it back up to overvalued. I don't know why we are so afraid of the undervalued, right? It's better than having it overvalued, believe it or not, right? Again, I started in 2016. This has been happening since 2012. Overvalued. Government subsidizing the purchase of foreign goods. Now, here is what is the problem. Look at column number three, the third column. Our non-energy fiscal balance, our non-energy fiscal balance has always been negative. Now, what was our saving grace? And these are challenges, and all of this has implications for our exchange rate, right? The non-energy sector, anything outside of energy, has always been negative. 
And that negative value has grown consistently. I'm talking about outside of the energy sector, we have services, manufacturing, and all of those things, agricultural and so on, has always been negative. Our overall fiscal balance has been negative. Now, why did we not worry about that? Because look at the one, two, three, four, for the fifth column, central government energy revenue. The energy revenue has always been used to cover the deficit in the non-energy sector. You know what I'm saying? Here? The energy sector's revenue or rents has been used to cover the deficit in the non-energy sector. So we're using the oil money to cover the deficit in all of the other sectors, which are not contributing to the economy. Now that we don't have the kind of energy revenue that we used to, what is going to happen? That deficit is going to rear its ugly head in the form of economic hardship that must be addressed. You hear what I'm telling you? So our problem did not just start because we misappropriated and misspent our rents from the oil days. Now, <clears throat> that deficit that we run in the non-energy sector is 20%, right, of GDP, unmanageable. And this is what happens. Now, this slide is, is, is sad because we made a lot of money. If you take any 10 year period, when oil was being produced and exported, refined and exported in Trinidad, any 10 year period when we were making oil and selling it and we had the refinery, Trinidad had made 200 billion US in revenue. You hear what I'm saying? Any 10 year period, 200 billion US in revenue. What did we do with that money? Well, we decided to subsidize everything because we have money instead of letting people pay the actual price for the good. So we subsidize when we had revenue. Now that we have no revenue, we have to remove the subsidies because we have no revenue to cover it. This is where the problem started. Had we invested that money that we made from the oil boom, had we invested it properly in infrastructure, in, uh, in the healthcare system, in reforming and redefining our education sector, we would have been way better off. Had we invested some of that 200 billion over a 10 year period in technology and not even creating technology, you know, adopting technology and implementing it in a very systematic way, in a way that made things very efficient, we would have seen a completely different Trinidad. No, we chose to now give it away in the form of subsidies. And we hurt ourselves. And now we're wondering, well, what is the problem? <clears throat> the global impact of the, the global, the knock-on effect of what is happening globally in terms of the, the, the pressures it's putting on our economy is one thing. But we started creating our own problem during the oil boom days. We created our own problem. The global, the impact of what is happening in the global economy just exacerbates the, the problem that we created. But we could have been in a very lofty position. But we chose, the government, the, the country chose to do differently. So what is the problem? The problem is how we spend this money, right? We spend money, and I chose the example of GATE because we're all in the education sector and we all want to get access to tertiary education. And I know all of you all who are here present, we will be seeing you in the classroom here in the Econ Department. We're looking forward to having you here. We'll have these lively discussions face to face and I won't be talking to boxes where nobody answers me, no questions. Thanks, Johansi Marshall, for asking a question. I would hope other people would post a question. Otherwise, I will ask questions and call names. Um, <clears throat> So vertical inefficiencies is what we've done. We've mastered the art of vertical inefficiencies in Grenada. And I chose the GATE program. Here's what happens with GATE. Who benefits from GATE? The persons that benefit from GATE are the persons who least need it. So should they actually be getting it? Some should get 
funded tertiary education. And some should not. Those who can afford it should not. That's an economic reality. And I speak to you from an objective econ a standpoint of, as an objective economist, not as someone who is bashing anything. This is economics. This is what we do. We're objective in evaluating systems and what happens when we make bad decisions. So we say education for everybody. Mind you, no one read the document Vision 2020 in detail, apparently, because GATE was supposed to be phased out. But now nobody wants to touch GATE because it, it has now become a political instrument. But GATE was only supposed to be administered for a certain number of years and phased out. We, we had a target for growth of human capital. <clears throat> and the effect of now su surpassing that target is that we're seeing wage suppression. Because we have so many people with degrees, employers have free reign on who to choose from, right? So here we again, creating a problem that now we don't have a, a, a working solution for. So we can't blame anyone but ourselves for extremely low wages because we are mass producing education when we're supposed to phase it out. And we have some brilliant mathematicians that are office holders because they figured you can increase VAT receipts by reducing VAT from 15% to 12%. Hmm. Okay. All right. And put in more items on the zero rated list. Hmm. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like one plus one equal two to me. That, that doesn't sound like maths using the abacus either. That sounds like nonsense. Anyway, <clears throat> so here we have the example of gate. And in this a graph, what we're saying here in region B, those individuals are the ones who, are, well, we have different income levels, right? So essentially what we're saying is the people in region A are the only ones who are the ones who are supposed to be getting gate. But what we have in reality is people in the regions, in regions A and B get in gate. That's a vertical inefficiency. And that's just one program that the government administers, that there's vertical inefficiency. So we are spending more. That, so this is the equivalent of what we're doing here. We're investing, let's say, a billion dollars, and we're getting absolutely no return, and somebody calling in the margins and saying, I need another half a billion. So we're not getting any returns based on the vertical inefficiencies. So again, here we are misallocating our scarce resources in terms of who has access to what. I didn't get into the detail of this because it kind of gets a little technical, but just suffice it to say, region A, you get gate. Region B, you don't. But as it stands, regions A and B get gate funding for tertiary level education. So we're wasting. Again, we're going back to what we, we're accustomed to, wasting, right? So what do we do? Is there an alternative? Now we have the currency pressures, we have the fiscal pressures, which is affecting the currency value, the exchange rates. So what do we do? We have to think about fiscal consolidation, <clears throat> right? That means we must bring public spending to less than 45%. We must reduce subsidies significantly and we have to redistribute or uh, redefine and restructure our social programs so that those who need it have access to subsidies and those who don't don't get it it should not be a free for all which is what it is now now we don't have social development programs we literally have welfare and welfare is ruinous because I can sit at home and say, the government covering this, the government covering that, nah, don't worry. But no, we have to create a system and a social structure where we understand our responsibility as consumers and our role as consumers. So the government really has to shave down the public sector, really shave off all the fat on the public sector. They're trying so hard to do this now. You see them trying hard with WASA. They're going to try hard with TNT, but 
it has been going on for so long, it has become the norm. So any attempt to redefine those institutions is going to mean problems, real problems. Strengthen the business environment. Right, make the ease of doing, work on the ease of doing business index. There must be governance reform and performance-based public sector pay. And this is one of our major challenges. Unions get a beat pan, burn tire, we want more money. But no one says, what am I going to do in exchange for more money? We want more money to cover our increase in cost of living, absolutely. But what am I going to do in exchange for that? All of these demands on the system has a direct effect on our exchange rate. Here's how it works. We beat pan, we burn tire, we strike. We get higher wages, right? We have more money. Are we going to spend that locally? No. We're going to now purchase more foreign goods. It increases the demand for foreign goods because we have more money. It may not necessarily increase the demand for foreign goods. It will increase the demand for foreign currency because now we're traveling. That puts pressure. That increases the demand for the foreign currency. So the foreign currency gets stronger and our currency gets weaker. That is how it ha happens. So when we hear about increases in, in wages, I start to tremble because I know the effect that places on our already overvalued currency. It's already overvalued. And now we're getting more disposable income. So now the demand for the foreign currency is even higher. When the demand for the currency gets very high, the foreign currency gets strong and ours get weak because the demand for our foreign currency is low. Oh, oh sorry, our demand for our local currency. The demand for our local currency is low. So we get weaker and the strong get stronger by virtue of what? Our consumption patterns and our decisions as consumers. So when we think, look at what is happening again in the exchange rate on that video, we have to look within ourselves and see, look at, look around. What do I have that I have bought locally? Do all my clothes come from local garment producers? Or do I go online and shop? When you go online and shop, there's the demand now for the foreign currency by way of using the credit card. That money comes from somewhere. Not to, mind, not to mention our US, uh, decrease in US reserves. But that comes from somewhere. We demand in the foreign currency goods, which places the demand for the foreign currency. The foreign goods, which the demand for the foreign currency increases. Again, we have to look within ourselves and see what we're doing. So we have to have what, um, what is called education for sustainable development. People must understand that our decisions directly affects trade currency value, which affects trade balances, which affects the price of the goods that we, the prices that we pay for goods. So we have to do some serious introspection here. So we must strengthen the, 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 the business environment domestically, and we must make ourselves more attractive to, as Roger Khan said earlier on, we must make ourselves more attractive to foreign investors so we can increase foreign direct investment, which increase the inflows of foreign currency. And that can replace the foreign currency that came in, the, foreign, the inflows that came from the energy sector. We will now be replacing it with the FDI from the other sectors. So again, what do we do with the labor market? This is a problem that is waiting to explode. The demand and supply side, no quick, fit, no quick wins. We're producing human capital, absolutely, but we're not utilizing the human capital, so there's a mismatch. We should not be engaging in too much, we should not be advocating for too much manufacturing sector improvements, right? We should be advocating for high level thinking service sector operations. We should be encouraging foreign consulting companies to come here because we have the brain power. You can come here and set up your shop. We'll give you a tax break, hire our skilled labor. 
and that will boost employment that will have a significant improvement in the government's tax receipts from payroll taxes and everybody walks away happy we should not be advocating too much for the manufacturing sector yes there is a manufacturing need for the manufacturing sector but the manufacturing sector is one that is automated <clears throat> the major producer of beer in trinidad increased their bottom line and they let go but 300 employees what did they do they replaced it with technology so the manufacturing sector can take care of itself with technology we can use the human capital for services that is why we have people employed in jobs that they're overqualified for disgruntled <clears throat> so we're underutilizing them so hence we have underemployment and we need to reintroduce some of the vocational education and reduce incentives for early retirement and people work until retirement age should be no incentive for you to retire early and consolidate your social benefits and make it more targeted so we need to be more targeted in our approach it's very simple you know very simple in two slides <coughs> sorry not two slides in three slides we have the solution to change turn this whole economy around who is going to be doing it who is willing to do it that's the challenge we have the solution here for them so uh why is social consolidation likely to be succeed now when i say shave off this or, or cut back on uh public uh, spending in the public sector um in the provision of public sector goods and services <clears throat> is a matter of retooling those individuals and putting them in different private sector operations but you have to improve the private sector operations and bring more businesses in so that when you shave off the public sector the private sector can now absorb those people and so everybody walks away happy. So we can't just go and shave it, right? There's some things that have to be put in place first, right? <clears throat> so if we work on this fiscal this um, fiscal consolidation by way of public spending and social programs and so on, it will signal our determination to succeed as a nation. Uh, we wouldn't have inflationary tax hikes because if we look at now our source of revenue, we're looking at it as more taxes, more taxes, more taxes. But there are other things that we can do besides increasing taxes, right? Um, and we can have more accommodative monetary policy. And we have fiscal policy, but our monetary policy needs to be a little bit more rigorous. And find a way to encourage banks. Banks are highly fungible, right? As I said, four banks in Trinidad has the total of 20 billion in assets. Get the banks in the mode of taking a risk to lend to people who want to open a business if you want to open a business you go to the bank they want things that you probably don't even have or have never dreamed of having yet make encourage them sit down have these discussions right it's meaningful discussions negotiations whether you want to call it some kind of tacit agreement something but encourage we can't force or legislate commercial banks but we can encourage and we can provide you know Certain things can come out, you know, in terms of the discussion, favorable things, right? It happens in every country, right? So one hand, no clap. And of course, it could be a little bit spurious, but we'll work with that. So in terms of the negative effect in terms of taxes, right? The distortive taxes are the ones we go after. And we, we, we don't go on the less distortive ones, right? We, we increase corporate tax. That's a distortive tax. We have not increased personal income tax. <clears throat> Goodness gracious, thank you. And a less distortive tax is a tax on immovable property. And that is the one we seem to have a challenge with. That is not going to affect the price of anything. The property tax is the oldest tax in the history of the world. And it is the easiest and cheapest tax to implement. But in true Trini form, we have made that a problem. <laughs> Just implement the property tax and let us be on with it, be on with our business. So, of course, the glimmer of hope is consolidation 
it's more like no this is not glimmer of hope and this might be some sarcasm in here the fiscal consolidation is more likely when things get worse that's when we will think about fiscal consolidation if you hear the people in washington dc and imf get on a plane that's when we will start to start, start to do fiscal consolidation before they reach here we consult, do full fiscal consolidation but until then we will continue to suffer not in silence because everybody's suffering now and so there we have the problem so but but the flip side of that is when we do that it is more likely to succeed when things bad so it had to get you know the saying is it had to get worse before it could get better that is exactly what we're experiencing having created our own problems we, it has to get worse before it can get better because if we do fiscal consolidation when things are seemingly good then it may not likely hold because we'll go back to our old habits but if we do it when things so bad that we see no way out of it we're not going to go back to our old habits right um so we have to be mindful of what we do everything that we do affects the exchange by as consumers has an impact on the exchange rate again that video said look in the mirror who is affecting the exchange rate us are there options outside of the valuation absolutely are they effective absolutely can they improve the terms of trade absolutely can they improve or strengthen our currency absolutely but we have to be willing to do that and that my friends brings us to our major concerns again we're turning a blind eye to these things which are waiting to explode we have an aging population that is a challenge because now it is going to create pressures on the national insurance program because remember that is uh those who pay in what you pay in is used to pay those who are on the on the retired side <clears throat> right so those who are collecting their national insurance they're living longer and the pool of people entering the workplace with low salaries right is dwindling all labor all labor force mind you is not even five hundred thousand. Eh? our labor force is quite small and productivity increases at 0 0.01 percent so we're not doing anything to improve output <clears throat> that's why i said performance based pay, based pay in the public sector so the extent of underemployment we utilizing people with high skills to do low skill jobs when i say low skill medium skill jobs again because of the pool of the the skill labor is so high the size of our public debt and the persistence of the deficits based on transfers and subsidies yes i am in agreement with the removal of the subsidies absolutely but there are certain things that should have been in place before you begin to remove subsidies we've been spoiled for so long what should have been done I, now i am for mind you people may think i'm crazy but i am for in addition to the removal of subsidies on fuel and implementation of a tax on fuel and i say that because it can have a great effect for economic growth but something has to happen what is that something there must be a very effective and efficient public transportation system you can walk out the road at 10 a.m and a bus there at 10 a.m if they say there's a schedule if you go to take a bus at 10 05 there's a bus at 10 05. don't tell me the bus coming at 10 and 8. 12 o'clock i still sit down there waiting on the 10 o'clock bus and then the 10 o'clock bus the 11 o'clock bus and the 12 o'clock bus come all at the same time so we have to put those things in place before I, because if i put a tax on people will drive less if they have a great public transportation system <coughs> you'll park your car knowing that you can walk on the road and get a bus and go to work right but if that is not in place what are you really telling me? right um the agricultural sector needs to be be improved significantly a nation that cannot feed itself cannot grow the sir arthur lewis if you're familiar with him you should read some of sir arthur lewis's book said an economy can only grow if there's an agricultural surplus we have no agricultural surplus we actually import everything almost everything garlic onion you name it we imported it goat uh, lamb plum 
we import everything. So we can't feed ourselves. So we have no food security. We need to work on that. Low labor productivity. People just don't produce. And that is by virtue of an, a, a very strong union. Right? They can advocate on your behalf, but you don't have to say what you do in an exchange for it. If you want, and people want 12 and 13%, not a 2% or 3% raise, you know, generally an increase in income is supposed to be the equivalent of, an in, of the inflation rate. So the inflation rate is 3%, but we want 12%. Think about what that does to your purchasing power and the pressure it places on demand for foreign currency. Speculation in the black market. Well, we have a very huge black market for everything. Um, and we need to work on that. And industrial relations have been strained over the years. All right? So, my friends, two minutes before 11 o'clock, I told you you weren't going to stay here till 12 o'clock. Now, let me hear now if you have any questions. Now, don't let me have done this for 12 to 12 hours and you have no questions. Yeah? Any questions, concerns, suggestions? Let's chat now. And you feel free to open your mics. If parents are around, teachers are around, guests are around, and you have questions, feel free to ask your questions. I'm here for that. Let's talk. So I'll stop sharing my slide, pull up my chat, and we can chat and so so forth. Come on. Hi. Hi. Hi, sir. This is Nikhila's mom. Darren, Darren is the name. Come on. I told you it's Darren. Oh, Darren. Okay. Hi, Darren. So my question more or less is with the agricultural sector. Can you just um, elaborate a little bit more on that? Because that's one sector that has, I think, has to be revamped in total. Because we pay ministers and government comes, government goes. And it's the same thing. And like you said, a country that cannot support or feed itself, right? we are heading for some trouble times ahead. So what is your, if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, just for my, um, my intellectual. Sure. sure, absolutely. Now, the sad part is, is the, one, is the one ministry that gets the smallest allocation every year, and is the one ministry whose allocation declines more and more every year. Now, they've been told that they can get these different allocations and grants to farmers and so on, they have access to these different things. Um, I'll tell you what the problems are and what needs to be done to fix the problems. Now, in the last budget that was read, the allocation to the agricultural sector was lower than the profits for the year before of prestige holdings. You hear what I'm saying? That's how low the allocation is. Now, yes, farmers have access to grants to improve and get more equipment and expand their operations. But in order to do so, there's the issue of land tenure. Farmers don't own or have any, any sort of, how do we say, it? not just not own. Basically, we have farmers that are squatters. They have no claim on the lands that they're on. They're on state lands, yes. But they don't have land tenure. They need the land tenure issue to be resolved before they can even access these grants to expand the operations. In addition to which, concessions need to be made for these farmers in terms of that is where subsidies should be going. Subsidies for the um, fertilizers that they have to use. That is where some of the subsidies should be going. In addition to which, um, not, it's not a matter of just spending more money. We have to address the land tenure issue. And for year after year after year, the former Minister of Agriculture has admitted and lamented that the land tenure issue had not been addressed. So that's the first thing, the land tenure, and then they can access the grants and provide some subsidies to them so that they can work on their operations. And that is where we will see some movement in the agricultural sector. <clears throat> There's not just, well, the agricultural sector on the whole, there is no reason for us to have to import goat. There's no reason for us to have to import plum for plum chow. We should have these things growing in abundance. 
not just of farm, not just our improving our culture, training farmers in the new technologically driven farming techniques. If you come to UE's Tech Agri Expo, and not just new uh, technologically driven farming techniques, we're also talking about resilient farming, farming that can withstand a hurricane, right? So we have the ability to produce, mass produce things like lettuce without even planting something in the ground. It is grown in water and the nutrients are fed to the lettuce in the water. Beautiful artisan lettuce. So we have the techniques. We just need to educate the farmers on the techniques and provide the means for them to acquire the equipment to implement these different things. And we will be, we don't need to think about exporting just yet. We just need to think about feeding ourselves. So when we go to the fresh produce section in any supermarket, we should be seeing locally produced and grown items. We go to the meat section, we should see locally produced, only locally produced. We have the ability to do it. We have an abundance of land available, not for growing uh, produce, but for rearing animals. We need to utilize those things. We can have in abundance large scale chicken farms. Large scale chicken farms. We can have large scale um, cattle rearing operations. <clears throat> I don't know what is the apprehension. We have created a system where it had, and I call it, it has been fetishized that it become a fetish that you must have this uh formal training in engineering and law and medicine and we have neglected and not just neglected but we have uh sort of made it ridiculed agriculture as an as a, as a possibility of a career option so so when you have all of that we need to work on those things changing the mindset of people in terms of what agriculture can do and the power of agriculture take a drive up one sunday morning if you can anybody go to the farmers markets uh, where people grow produce and sell produce in the farmers markets tell me agriculture is not successful just by looking at the par parking lot of where those farmers park their vehicles it is very lucrative but we seem to tell people that agriculture <clears throat> that's like when i chose economics and i was on the route to medicine everybody in the family was like what are you going to do with econ the same thing i can do with medicine you just have a passion for it and you move forward so that's my answer to you thank you sir um just to conclude that though um the vegetable farmers they are the ones that get the most um they get cut up meaning that if they're fertilizers and all their overheads have increased, right? And they go to market. They don't get what they are worth, you know, with the weather conditions and the seasonal auctions and all those different things. So they are, I think, most affected based on their, their produce and their sales. And what I think too is that how you said the land tenure, you know, that's always a matter, always a problem because land is always an issue. But isn't it that that same land they now use for AGC to build houses in comparison to, to rearing um, livestock and, and vegetable farming? Again, <clears throat> we don't treat with the problem because we know that every key you give out is a vote. But if you give somebody land tenure, that may not necessarily be a vote. So we have these competing interests. And you are correct. So that, and, and, and you are right with the fertilizer. That's why I said subsidize them. You need to subsidize things like fertilizer rather than, I mean, I, people could drive, you know, they don't drive, but we need to eat. So subsidize the fertilizer, sub, subsidize the chicken feed and all these different things, you know? um I, I and of course um what, what you were saying is that um what was the last point you made there about the land tenure that they utilize it to make to build houses yes 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 absolutely um and that is poor planning we don't plan we just think generally people, governments think about the votes they don't think about long-term planning and and of course utilizing the agricultural land you see what is going on right they created mass flooding and all that because of the fact that the floor there's a whole lot going on behind there but um, yeah, you're correct. They utilize, they misallocate, um, misuse the land that we have available for uh, other things that, well, the whole provision of housing issue is a whole other discussion, but the government shouldn't even be doing that. But 
I agree with you 100%. Uh, yes, Roger. Good, yes. good morning, Dr. Conrad. Um, morning. Well, mine is similar in terms of the subsidies that you were talking about in terms of the fertilizer. I, think. I wanted to ask, are all subsidies and transfers bad or are there good subsidies and transfers when you're looking at like, I know you talk about gate and possibly CDAP and so forth. Could you just elaborate on more on that? All right, subsidies, all subsidies can be good if they are properly targeted. You don't want wastage where you, subsidies are concerned, right? Um, and how it works, a subsidy is to encourage something, something positive that can have a positive externality. So if you subsidize something like fertilizer, that can have a positive externality, a, a positive, the effect of a positive externality, because here you have your subsidizing fertilizer, people can buy food, uh, feed uh, and fertilize their crops, you subsidize um, uh, feed for animals, yes, people can now, you know, and so we will get production will increase, supply will increase, the price will come down a little bit, and we will even have some for export. So we'll feed ourselves. And we, so that is what you want to encourage. So you subsidize fuel means you want to encourage people to drive, but then you complain traffic is a problem. But you encourage it because you're subsidizing it. How we look at it in economics is a subsidy is for something to, to encourage a behavior that has a positive effect. And, an, and, and a tax is to have an, it's a corrective me mechanism. It's not punitive, but it's corrective. So if you tax fuel, you're telling people, come off the road a little bit, drive less. You have five people in one household and you're using five vehicles and all only going the same desk, same area. All only going in Port of Spain. Oh gosh, one park the car city gate and walk, right? But that is how we, so not all subsidies are bad, but it must be targeted. Is the when subsidies are not targeted and people who are not really in need of a subsidy receives it, that is where the inefficiencies come in. That is where the vertical inefficiencies come in. So to clear that up, not all subsidies are bad. As a matter of fact, all subsidies can be good once it is to encourage something with a positive externality and it is targeted. That makes a subsidy a good subsidy. I have one more question. Hold on. Um, Makala, um, let, um, let, let Roger finish his thought. Uh, Roger, is Roger or who? Who was that? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much, sir. Oh, no problem. Yes, Makala. Okay, so my question is um, in terms of the rate of exchange. Now, I am in the import export business for the last 20 years, and I've seen what the ROE has done. And only the day before, the PM came on television to address that situation, right? However, this has been happening from way back Hold when. Hold on, I missed the first part. The, the first part, I am involved in import export business for right. the last 20 years. So I know the rules of the, ROE, of the rate of exchange and how long it's right. been affecting companies, right? So with the PM coming on board on local TV to advise of what is happening and what they are doing, um, I think it's a step too late because this has been happening for the last over five years. Now, because of what's happening here with importation and more drain on the central bank, right? Um, they are trying to, to find ways to make it better. But in your predicament or in your, in your experience, what we face now with the ROE, how long again do you think we will continue to face it? Because it is a challenge. You put on the spot there because I don't have an answer. <laughs> that could go on forever. As I said, I mean, the decision lag is always the problem. And that could go on for, year, for years to come. And that is our problem. We don't address issues when they come up in a meaningful way. Everything becomes armchair talk, but no real action. So to say how, how how soon will they act? I say we have a problem with uh, what we have in Trinidad is an implementation deficit. We talk about things, yeah, 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 but we don't really move to actually address the issue in a meaningful way. We give good armchair talk and it's done when you leave that room, the discussion stays in that room. It doesn't follow the decision makers out of that room into the halls of where the decisions are made. It stays in that room with the people who raise the issue. That's the best I can tell. Okay, thank you. I just want to have an idea so I know how to gauge business. Um, it's, let me tell you, as, as I indicated, the problems that we have now did not just start. They started way back in the 60s and they continue to be problems. 
So you can use that as a gauge. If the problems we have now existed since the 60s and there's still problems now and they have not been addressed. And let me tell you, there are a million ways to address these issues, but they have gone unaddressed. That just gives you an idea as to how long they'll take before they address anything. It's a lack of proper management, but thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Yes, go ahead. Anybody else? Samara, any questions from you? Kayleen, I'm calling names of people who wouldn't say nothing. Christina, I see Amanda Wellington Peters. Any questions? Right. Now, these, um, this session has been recorded and the recordings are going to be made available to you. Um, and so you will be able to have access to it and you can share it and you can listen to it again in case you may have missed something in the delivery or the discussion. Uh, let me just put this one slide up again for you. Uh, and you can, as a student, as a parent, as a guest in the, in the audience, you can always feel free to email me. This is my email address. You can always feel free to email me if you have a question. If you're a student and in class and you have a question based on your economics and we want some help with something, I ain't gonna do your homework for you. I ain't gonna do no, no homework for you or your project or whatever. But if you have questions, you can always feel free to email me. All I ask is that when you send me an email, just indicate in the first sentence who you are, under what context we met and just say exchange rate lecture or discussion. And I will know, well, all right, I know who this person is because I have to be careful. Sometimes the media houses, you, you see a strange name and it might be from somebody from the Express or the Guardian or some one of them media outlets. So, you know, just tell me under what circumstances we met. And I'd be more than happy to provide support. Um, and even if it means us having a little one hour uh, 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 Zoom session, I, I'm open to that. You can feel free to contact me. Right. Um, again, we're here for you and we really hope that you would think about economics as a major. As I said, it's the most powerful discipline and I call economics a global passport. Once you have a degree in economics, it is one of those subjects that what you learn in the classroom is not just directly transferable to outside of the classroom, but it is transferable, transferable globally. So that's why I call economic, a degree in economics a global passport. Um, <clears throat> what what you are learning, what you are learning here, people elsewhere in the world are learning the same thing. Um, and so we can fit in anyway. So I really encourage you to consider that. If you want to stop by the department when we go back face to face and pay us a visit, hey, we look forward to having you. And again, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you coming out on a Saturday morning. And I hope that you would join us for another lecture, which is next week. Saturday at the same time from 9 to 12, uh, that will be one on elasticity. We touched on elasticity today. So if you come next week to the elasticity lecture, then you can then use this week to get further clarification on some of the things we talked about in terms of the demand and supply of foreign, the demand for foreign goods, whether elastic or inelastic, and what that means for, for pricing and, and, and so on. So again, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you again so much for having you. Thank you for taking, well, putting up with me for the last two hours. You know, I'm very animated. As I said, I love economics. And I wish you all the best um, uh, uh, as you um, proceed to your end of term exams and so on. Or those of you who will be writing exams, wish you all the best. And I look forward to seeing you. Well, I won't be doing the lecture, but I'll be joining. All right. So again, thank you. And you have a very wonderful rest of the weekend. I'll just hang around until people exit.
All right, you too. All you all have a great weekend.